Alrighty, let's get going. So this is really my favorite, uh, my favorite lecture because this kind of encapsulates everything there is uh, to talk about uh, in query optimization. Um, it's really one of my favorite areas. So if you get as excited about this stuff uh, as I do, please come see me, have a chat. Uh, this, this, is, this is my favorite stuff. Little, little bit of a, a en enthusiastic plug. Uh, but before I get on to the actual uh, content, I just want to remind everyone that Project One is due on Monday. Um, kind of snuck up, but uh, it's due on Monday. Uh, if you haven't started already, please do so. Uh, it is a little bit harder than it looks. Um, okay, so uh, what we're going to be talking about today is not necessarily relevant for Project One, although it's a great way to get your name up on the leaderboards, which are, by the way, uh, people have started populating them. Uh, okay, so what is query optimization? Well, we talked about this general uh, framework of a database engine uh, that has these kind of multiple stages, uh, that takes the select statements, that translates them into a relational algebra expression, translates that relational algebra expression into an iterator that actually implements it, and then use, uses that iterator to actually produce a concrete output. Now, I've been kind of, uh, those of you who have asked uh, why exactly we're do using this relational algebra uh, representation? Uh, well, the reason for that is that it's a very simple structure to manipulate. And that's what we're going to get into today. Um, a query optimizer basically takes one of these relational algebra trees and uses a couple of very, uh, of independently very simple, very easy to convey equivalencies to uh, produce a new tree that is the same, uh, that is equivalent, uh, but that uh, presumably is much more efficient. Now I'm using this term equivalency uh, a little bit uh, hand in, a, in a very hand-wavy manner because, well, there's uh, a whole bunch of different ways that you can define equivalency. Uh, case in point, Spock. Uh, so Spock is played by two different actors, depending on whether you're talking about the classic, I mean good uh, version, and the, the new uh, <clears throat> not so good version. Uh, but even in the old version, there were two versions of Spock. There was the, the good Spock with, without a beard, and there was the evil Spock. You may have noticed I've grown a beard. It's because I'm evil. Okay, there are many different ways of talking about equivalence. There's, uh, you can talk about um, uh, two things being the same with respect to, uh, to their beardedness, two, uh, two uh, things being the same with respect to the actor playing them, um, or just in terms of the entity that they represent. But kind of the, the theme of query optimization and uh, the theme of much of the optimization that we're going to talk about in the second half of the term is this idea of uh, figuring out what is equivalent. And if you can say that X and Y represent the same thing, at least with respect to the features that you care about, and Y is somehow better, performs better, performs faster, then you can easily replace X with Y, or, or all instances of X with Y, and get something better. So to kind of illustrate this point, I have two different relations. And if I just say, are these two the same? Are they? No. Uh, and the, the relations themselves aren't, they, they're representing two different sets of tuples. They have two completely different schemas. They have two different uh, sets of values. Uh, they're different. What if I were to project uh, down to one attribute? Now they have the same schema. Are they, are they the same? No. I mean, they're, the schema may be the same, so they're equivalent with respect to the schema, but they're different. They're, uh, the, the values in the relation are different. On the other hand, what if I were to project and actually manipulate some of those values? Let's say I subtracted one from each of the A attributes in S. 
are these two relations, the relation represented by R and the relation represented by that query, are they the same? Yeah, so now these two are the same. Um, I could do the same thing to R. I could manipulate R and I can manipulate S. And these two queries represent the same relation. So loosely speaking, we're going to, from the perspective of query optimization today, um, two expressions are going to be equivalent if they produce the same output. Now, there's something a little bit uh, fishy about that statement because I haven't actually said what the same output is. And in fact, there's a couple of different ways that I could talk about the same output. And it depends on what semantics we're using uh, for our queries. So under bag semantics, these, all of these are completely different because they all represent very different bags. On the other hand, under set semantics, the first and the third are the same. They both represent the same set of values. One of them has two copies of the, the tuple two, but if I, remove, if I remove duplicates, those two represent the same, oh sorry, all three of them represent the same thing. Uh, excuse me, under bag semantics, the first two are equivalent. Under list semantics, none of these are equivalent because the first and second uh, relations have different orders. So these two are um, out of order with respect to one another. Now to keep things simple, today we're going to focus mostly on bag semantics. So are you producing the same, uh, the same bag of tuples as output? We're not going to worry about order, although order actually uh, works into the, all of these, these uh, equivalencies that we're going to talk about pretty easily. Also, order depends on how the uh, operators are implemented, so we're not going to uh, worry too much about that at the moment. Okay. So the basic idea that we're, we're going to talk about today is this idea of equivalencies. Are two expressions guaranteed to produce the same output? We're going to start with a very high-level view of this. So I can just rattle off a whole bunch of these um, simple equivalencies in terms of uh, just equivalencies. Uh, here's one expression, here's another expression, and uh, I can, we can go through this, or we will go through this example uh, to illustrate that each of these are uh, the same. So let's take a look at a couple of them. Selection. What happens if I have select A and select B? Excuse me. Uh, so I have a selection predicate up there. Uh, select on the condition C1 and C2 and C3. Now, I could implement that in two ways. I could either individually look at every single tuple in my input and say, OK, this satisfies condition 1, condition 2, condition 3. Or I could look at the, the tuples in sequence. I could first uh, apply condition 1, so filter out everything that doesn't satisfy condition 1, then filter out everything that doesn't satisfy condition 2, and then filter out everything that, th that doesn't sa satisfy condition 3. These two representations of the query are equivalent. And anywhere I have a select of condition 1 and condition 2, I can replace that with an equivalent condition, select condition 1, and then select condition 2, and then uh, read that from my source relation. You can do something similar with union. So select A or B is the same as select A from R, union select B from R. I have to eliminate duplicates there. One other feature of selection is that it's commutative. So select A of select B of R is the same as select B of select A. A of R. You can prove that by just counting on the fact that selection of um, that uh, the AND operator is also commutative. So there's a couple of different uh, properties that we can play with with selection. There's a couple of properties we can play with uh, projection as well. 
if I project something and then I project it down to a smaller set of attributes later, well, it doesn't matter what I projected to at first. What matters is the schema of the final projection. So I can get rid of any nested projection. The only one I care about is the one at the very end. I can actually go in the other direction too. I can introduce any projections I want as long as I don't get rid of any attributes that are relevant further on. And a couple of other equivalencies, uh, join and cross product are associative and commutative. I'm sure, uh, yeah. Um, sorry, idempotent means that if I have uh, a, nest, a projection nested inside another projection, the inner projection doesn't matter. And I'm, I'm sure all of you have encountered uh, term, these terms associative, commutative, uh, or many of these terms in, uh, in algebra or you know, algebra or uh, in some earlier level. Uh, because this is essentially the same stuff. Um, joins and unions, you can kind of think of them as a form of product and, uh, you, uh, product and addition. That's beyond today, anyway. Uh, OK, so let's go through this with a little bit of an example. Let's, let's see how you might apply these ideas uh, with a bit of an example. So using only these equivalencies, can we demonstrate that join is associative? Uh, sorry, uh, that not join is associative. Can we demonstrate uh, that R join in parentheses S join T is equivalent to T join R uh, join S? And I'm going to need some whiteboards. I hate the design of these classrooms. Let me copy that down and. So R join S join T is equivalent to T R join S. OK, here's my, uh, my postulate. I am uh, trying to prove that these two are equivalent. So using only the properties above, how might I go about demonstrating that these two are equivalent? How might I? Uh, for example, transform this expression into this one. Yeah. Okay. So uh, S and T. At, uh, so that's equivalent. So these two statements are equivalent. Um, associative property, okay. So R T, I can shift the parentheses. And one more commutativity property. So uh, T join R join S. And those two are the same thing. So using these two simple, very easy to express, very easy to prove uh, properties, I can show that something more complex uh, is equivalent, or I can transform one expression into another expression that presumably might be more efficient. We'll talk about how to judge that uh, today and later on in, in next week. OK, so these are kind of the, the basis, uh, the, the basis for uh, everything we're going to talk about. And I'm not going to enumerate all of the, the operators. Uh, the textbook has a really good just it, it just lists everything in section 16.2. Um, but we'll go over the, the high level ones today, and at least the ones that you'll need for the project. Uh, project two. So selection interacts with projection in a couple of ways. Um, 
in particular, selection uh, commutes with projection. So I can take a projection and I can move it inside a selection, uh, or I can take a projection and I can move it outside of a selection. Um, with the caveat that this only works if uh, the attribute set and the condition are compatible. In other words, if the, uh, all of the attributes in uh, A are also in C, uh, referenced by C. A has to include all of the, the columns referenced by C. So let's use this for an example. Um, I should just keep the board up a little bit. Is there another one in here? Nope. Okay, I have two expressions there. Can I transform this expression into this one? Or vice versa? Using only this and everything else that we've, uh, that I had on the previous slide. I'll start you off. And, okay, so what can I do with that expression? Yeah? From this expression, we know that uh, C is not in A. Uh, well, we don't know anything about A and C in that, in that case. So what can I do with, uh, with projection, at least? Okay, so I can, I can add more projections. In fact, I can throw in projections wherever I want. They're pretty cool like that. Um, so I can throw in another projection here. What do, I wanna, what do I want to project here? So A and all of the columns in C. All right. And then I have my selection, R. All right, uh, one more parentheses. OK. Uh, all right, so I'm almost there. What else do I need? Hmm? Yeah, so projection and selection commute. So I can just swap the order. Uh, select C, of project, dot, 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 of R, and I have the other expression. So here's a question for you guys. What, why would I want to do this? Or is this ever a good idea? Yeah, so projections reduce the amount of data that you're working with, and uh, if it's the case that, oh, sorry, it was hidden. Um, and so if R, by, by projecting away some columns of R, you're reducing the size of your working set, which in turn means that you can do more in memory, you can take better advantage of cache, uh, everything gets a lot faster, potentially. Ah, yeah, so um, I could also apply selection first and be able to reduce the size of my working set. That's a great question. So then the, the, the next question is, which is better? So each of them has the potential to reduce the size of my working set. Which one, which one is better? Yep. Yeah. 
So there are some, so you might have a very large number of tuples. Um, so uh, it's better to project uh, first. I see. So this is, it uh, depends on the number of columns or the number of rows. Yeah, but uh, also one thing that we need to consider that uh, if you're operating in one tuple at a time, so it is better to project first and then do select like, because if you need cache, then it is better to project first. So you're, because you're operating one tuple at a time, it's better to, uh, to project and select. Um, so it's a little bit of a trick question because there are a million different thing, different factors that go into which one is better. Um, projecting away a lot of columns early on might help if you have very wide relations. Uh, projecting or selecting out certain rows might help if you have a very uh, aggressive filtering predicate. Uh, and in both cases, you're doing work to filter and you're doing work uh, to project. So. This is the first time uh, that I've really used the phrase, it depends in class. And it's one that you're going to start hearing progressively more and more over the term. Uh, because this is a bit of a trick question, which one of these is better? Um, the answer is, it depends. It depends on the implementation. It depends on the, uh, uh, it depends on the data and a lot of factors. And while I'm not going to answer uh, that in more detail today, in the next couple of lectures we'll start talking about uh, what's called cost-based optimization, where we actually take a look at some of those factors and try and come up with a model of how the, the performance of the operator would interact with the, the queries that we're throwing, or with the, the data and all of the other contexts that we're throwing at it. Yeah. So the, the question is, uh, how is the cache related to uh, selection and projection? And in both cases, uh, because in both cases, you're, you're using the cache. Um, so the answer is, it's only tangentially related. Um, the main connection in this case is the size of your working set. And by reducing the size of your working set, you are going to make better use of every level of the memory hierarchy, including the cache, including memory, uh, and potentially including disk. Well, that, that's the thing. Both of these are going to reduce the size of your working set, and which of them reduces the size of your working set more depends a lot on uh, the, um, how uh, aggressively the selection predicate removes tuples, uh, tuples, uh, how uh, how many columns get projected away. Uh, it depends on a lot of factors. And we'll, we'll start going into how to measure some of these factors and how to integrate them uh, into uh, your, your planning strategy in midway through next week. Does that, yeah. So the question is, um, is the join operation still commutative under theta join? And I'm absolutely glad you asked that uh, because um, I have a, uh, well, okay. Uh, we're gonna need one more definition uh, for me to answer that. And then we can actually work through that on the board. Uh, so first off, 
One more equivalence I'm going to throw at you is just the definition of join. So a join is a selection sitting on top of a cross product. So I can go from cross product to join and I can go from join to cross product. Obviously there's only certain cases where this is beneficial. Uh, in other words, where I have an equality or a single uh, uh, or an inequality that I can use to speed up my join. But hypothetically, I can do this for any condition. Now, uh, ah, there's an eraser. All right. So the question was, what happens? Uh, what happens with associative? Uh, is join associative for theta joins as well as equi joins? <coughs> so first off, modulo the schema. In other words, the, the schema ordering might change, but if we disregard the order of the schema elements, is it the case that these two are equivalent? Yeah. So if I have two tuples uh, in on my left-hand side, or three tuples on my left-hand side, two tuples on my right-hand side, um, then this is going to produce 1a, 2a, 3a, 1b, 2b, uh, and 3b. And the only thing that changes uh, when I flip the order is the uh, order of these elements. a1, a2, uh, a2 a3, or a, a1, uh, b1, a2, b2, a3, b3. It'll change the ordering, but it won't change the actual content. Okay, so let's say I put a selection predicate on top of this. Is this still allowed? So if I do a selection on top of two things that are equivalent, the selection output is going to be identical. It's kind of like doing select of uh, from R and select from, or well, I'm using, let's call it Q, select from Q, because, or Q prime. If I know that Q and Q prime are the same thing, these are going to produce identical outputs. Okay. Does it matter what C is? No. Now, we have our equivalence up there. It says that this is identical to select R, or sorry, not select, but R. Eh. That's equivalent that. So, it's a little bit weird, but by using these simple rules, you can prove to yourself that much more complex, if you accept that the, 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 uh, the primitive rules are correct, which it's, it's much easier to accept that a, a simple, easy to understand rule is correct than something much more complex, but you can actually use that to prove to yourself that something much more complex is equivalent as well. Now the intuition for this uh, is that the selection, uh, because selection is, because a join is just a selection sitting on top of a cross product, you can reorder the cross product and get the same result. Okay, uh, let's go through, oh wow, we are you're running a bit late. Um, I will put this example up on uh, Piazza tonight. Uh, put this up on 
Piazza tonight. Uh, but basically, you can demonstrate that um, a selection through a couple of different, eh, you know what? This one actually is kind of relevant, so let's go through it. Um, this one is actually kind of nifty. Ugh, I don't want to erase, so I'm going to be lazy. Okay. Let's say I want to demonstrate that these two are equivalent. But again, I want to use only the rules that we've discussed so far. How would I go about doing that? Uh, sorry? Our join? Uh, where do I have that? Um, well, so I have... So what I could do, potentially, is say that this whole shebang is equal to r join um, r dot b equals s dot b and r dot a uh, is greater than 3 s. That, that's not quite what we're looking for. So that, that is literally what that rule says. Ah, okay. So we need to decompose some stuff. Uh, so how would I, what would I decompose? Okay, so selection r dot a is greater than 3. Uh, did I? Uh, on top of a selection of r a equals s b. Um, on top of R join S. Now this thing turns into what we want. Uh, this turn, thing can turn into a join. Uh, R join S on A equals B. And then we do a selection R A greater than 3 on top of that. Great. Quick example. Um, and, well, when is this a good idea? Well, this is a good idea because uh, it gives you joins. Um, and this is the, uh, the kind of select, or, whoops. Typo here, that should be a B, that should be a B. Uh, this, the, the kind of condition for, for having this is when you have attributes from both sides. Now, uh, one more rule that I'm going to throw, or another rule I'm going to throw at you, is that you can push selections in, yes? That is a, uh, so the, the comment is, wouldn't it be for, uh, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be more efficient to do the selection of RA on R before you pass that to the join? That is a great observation. Uh, we have not yet covered a rule uh, to, to address that. However, um, that's the next rule. So you can take any selection, and as long as the, all of the attributes of the selection apply to only one side of the cross product or join, then you can um, push the selection down into that side of the join. Um, all right, so simple example. Let's, let's even continue on uh, from the previous one. How would I go about transforming uh, this into one where the selection has been pushed down? Again, using only the rules we've discussed so far. Yeah. Okay, so l one step at a time. So first off, if I'm starting here, and I'm going to rewrite this as uh, C prime and C, I have to take one step back because I don't have any rules that apply to joins 
just yet. Everything applies solely to cross products. So I have uh, select of uh, C applied to select of C prime applied to join. Uh, sorry, applied to the cross product. OK. What next? So I want to get this guy all the way down to R. Selection of C of uh, C prime. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we have, uh, well, let me rewrite that essentially. Uh, C of select C prime of R cross, or sorry, R cross S. Um, okay, so I, wanna, I want this thing around the R. So what do I, so I can, okay, so selection is commutative. So I'm allowed to do C prime, select of C prime, select of C, R cross S. Now using that rule, I can push that guy in. And now this thing is sitting around, uh, this condition is sitting around a cross product. So I can convert that back to a join and select C of R join on C prime with S. So that gets us all the way to the end. And I'll, uh, yeah. All right, cool. So you can do similar things with projection. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, uh, and we'll skip the example. But the basic idea is similar. Uh, you take the columns that come from the left-hand side, the columns that come from the right-hand side, and you can project, uh, create projections around uh, both of those, uh, both sides. And I'll put up an example on the, um, on Piazza. All right. Yes. Uh, in oh if uh, in this exam in the example yeah. uh, so if C draws on columns that are in S you can't do this I think I did I put that in there uh, show that oh yeah um, sorry so this should be there should be uh, a comment on here. Um, that that is only true if C only applies to the, uh, if C only draws on the attributes of R. This is no longer true, obviously, if C doesn't, uh, if C draws on attributes of S. Uh, good question. Any, any other questions up to this point? All right. Um, Okay. One other comment. Um, so unions and intersections are both commutative and associative. In other words, you can flip the order, you can flip the parenthesization. Um, it's not too much uh, to do there. Selection and projection both commute with union. So you can uh, take a projection and apply it to all of the nodes of the union. Uh, again, uh, the textbook uh, from a high level perspective, Enumerating these rewrite rules isn't quite as interesting uh, from my perspective as just understanding the basic idea of being able to rewrite certain expressions into other expressions. So if you want a full list, uh, the textbook does a great job of enumerating all of the possibilities. So let me, <clears throat> let me give you guys an example. And I, I gave this example to a couple of, uh, a couple of people who asked why were uh, using the relational algebra tree. 
And one of the big motivations for that is that it makes your translation layer much, much simpler. Oh, I should probably do that. It makes your translation layer much, much simpler. And I keep saying this, translate in as stupid a way as possible, generate a tree, because you can always take that tree and optimize it later. And we're going to through, go through a really quick example here that shows that you can take this really stupid translation right here. This is completely literal. Um, take all of the, the from clauses, build up a join of all of them, take all uh, the where clause, put that as a selection predicate on top, and take the projection and put that on top of that. So we're going to start with this, and we're going to go through the steps and generate something that's much, much more efficient. <clears throat> so starting with, uh, with this parse tree here, what seems like it would be a, a good first step to take? Hmm? OK, so we wanna, might want to push r.b down. Um, actually started with a slightly different, I need to make these slides adaptive to what you guys say. Um, <clears throat> I did something actually quite similar. Uh, rather than pushing r.b down, I actually started by uh, trying to build up the join. So, and both approaches are, are perfectly legitimate. Um, whichever set of rewrite rules works, um, do that. So I can take the selection predicate, I can split it up into the original selection predicate as well as the uh, a, a predicate that makes sense for building a join. And I can then take that and actually use it to build a join. And typically these two steps will get merged together. I'll take it, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is not necessarily, excuse me, I'm, you're right. You need to do, you need to push down. Uh, if you use the rules that I was describing, you need to use all of the, uh, if you only use the rules that we've described so far, then you actually do need to push r.b down first. Um, that's actually a great exercise. I'll, I'll put it up on Piazza. Uh, can you push a selection down through a join? And I think it's, We've actually done some examples that kind of illustrate it, uh, but the, you can take a selection and you can always push it down through a join. Selection commutes with selection, and then select. Uh, anyway, I'm yeah, skipping over that. Uh, so then I push down the selection through the join and do the same thing. Uh, translate or split out r.b, build a join, and then uh, use the and then push the selection predicate down through uh, the join. Oops. Bah. So really what I want you guys to get, a, get out of this is that I can put as much logic into my translation layer as I want, and I can make, I can figure out for this query, I can very easily figure out that r.b is uh, a join predicate on r and s, uh, sorry, r.b and s.b are a join predicate on r and s, and I can figure out that s.d and t.d are a join predicate on those. But this is going to make the translation step much harder. And here, what we've done is we've taken a couple of very simple rules. Split selections, turn selections and cross products into joins, and um, push down selections. And between all of these rules and pattern matching on the relational algebra tree, and we'll, I'll go over uh, how to implement pattern matching in a couple of lectures, but by doing some very simple pattern matching on this tree, 
I can replace one structure with another that is completely equivalent, much more efficient, and that actually does all of this interesting logic that um, you'd want to put into the translation layer. In other words, translate in as stupid a way as possible and then optimize later. And the other takeaway I want you guys to get out of this is that you can do optimization basically by pattern matching. Again, I'll, we'll, we'll get into how this, uh, into the logistics of how this can get implemented in Java, but essentially the idea of optimization is that you find certain pat or of query optimization is that you find certain patterns in the tree and replace them with other patterns that are better. And what this gets me to is uh, kind of a rough outline of project two. You know, project one isn't due yet, but just to give you some idea of what's on the horizon. Project two is basically going to consist of implementing this kind of optimizer, um, including some slightly more advanced join algorithms than just, uh, than just uh, nested, uh, nested loop join. And also we're, uh, what we're gonna talk about in a couple of lectures is uh, dealing with limited memory. So we'll talk about a couple of algorithms uh, for dealing with limited memory and uh, your project two is basically going to involve implementing uh, one or more of these. All right, we're about out of time. I'll post a couple of these examples on Piazza so you can try them out. Uh, questions, yeah. Sure. Um, this guy? Or, uh, that one? Um, uh, say the first half of that or again. If you replaced those with uh, the ors with ands. Ah, so uh, and s dot uh, s dot c is less than five, or uh, s dot d, excuse me, is equal to t dot d. Uh, that's a great question. Um, there is one rewrite rule that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk where you could take this and essentially turn it into a union. So select of A or B from R is equivalent to select A from R union or set union select B from R. Now that may or may not be beneficial in this case. Um, usually it's, well, there are some cases where it is, there are some cases where it isn't. In general though, I mean, what, what impact would you expect it to have? So we have, uh, we'll go back uh, to the start. We, yeah. So if you had an or there, well, first off, you wouldn't be able to do, you wouldn't be able to do that rewrite, uh, this rewrite. Right? So a select of A and B is very different from select of A or B. What you do in that case is probably just push down the r.b, try and build the lower level join more efficiently. And at least naively, what you could do is just have that selection predicate sitting there above the nested loop join because you can't do much better. Um, if you wanted, whether or not you, uh, you try and push that further depends on what kind of rewrite rules you define. But you can get very far with just uh, the and rewrite rule for selection, 
the select combines with cross product to form a join rule and the push down selection rule. And I think between, uh, between those, that is about 90% of what the reference implementation does in terms of optimization. So sometimes you can't do better, but you're not trying to do perfect, you're trying to do as good as you can. Does that address your question? It's kind of roundabout. All right, um, see everyone on Friday. <laughs>